brothers, sisters, friends, and neighbors, I am delighted to be here once again. And we express our sincere appreciation to each and every one that is present. Uh, Mike Hatcher, my dear friend, I love him dearly, and also his wife Karen, the elders in this great, great church. I'm reading to you from the first chapter of the book of First Corinthians. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and sustenance our brother. Unto the church of God, which is that call back to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. With all that in every place, called upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. That in everything you enrich by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you will call into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. For this I say, every one of you said, that I am a Paul, I am a Paulus, I am Cephas, and I am Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you but Christmas and Gaius. Let's say that I had baptized in my own name. I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not what I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Leaping out of these 17 verses. The subject that's under investigation at the present hour is Christ divided. I'd like to begin first of all this evening by observing the nature in which this question is asked. Now if you and I lift this question out of its contextual setting, we're going to miss what Paul is trying to tell us. For Paul says in verse 10, I beseech you, brethren. Oftentimes we use this passage to apply and uh, to discuss denominationalism. But that's not Paul's argument here. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren. Not Baptists. Brethren. Not Methodists. Paul is appealing for unity among brethren. But that unity that Paul is appealing to, it coincides with the 14 affirmations of which Paul had already said. May I give those to you? In verse 1, it's through the word of God. That's by his authority. Paul says something in verse 10, that you ought to be together. Paul says that you ought to speak the same thing. Paul says that you ought to have the same mind. Paul says that you ought to have the same judgment, but it's predicated upon what Paul has already said. According to the will of God, that's by his authority, that you all have been sanctified. That's why you should be together. You all have been set aside for a holy purpose. That's why you should speak the same thing. Paul also says in verse 2 that you have been called to be saints. Well, how did that take place, Paul? According to 2 Thessalonians 2.14, you are called by the Gospel Acts 18, verses 1 through 8. That's why you ought to be together. Paul says, and let there be no schisms or no divisions among you. Why, Paul? Because in verse number 3, you have the peace of God. That eliminates the gossiping. That eliminates the backbiting. Because you have the peace of God. That's why 
you ought to be together. That's why you ought to speak the same thing. But not only that, notice what Paul says in verse number 4. That you all have received grace from God. That's why you ought to be together. Notice what Paul says in verse number 5. That you all are in the rich. That's why you ought to be together. That's why you should speak the same thing. Notice what Paul says in verse number 6. All of you have been confirmed in the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why you should have the same line. That's why you should have the same judgment. Notice what Paul says in verse number 7. All of you have come behind in no gift. You all have gifts coming from God. That's why you ought to be together. Notice what Paul says in verse number 8. God will confirm you unto the end. That's why you should have the same judgment. Notice what Paul says in verse number 9. God has called you into the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I need to tell you and emphasize this, that this fellowship that Paul is talking about is just talking about two fellows in the same ship. But I need to tell you also, this ship that we're talking about is not some carousing, party going, luxury line. It's the whole ship of Zion, the church of Christ. That's why we ought to be together. Then Paul says, now I beseech you, brethren. This word beseech, according to the lexical study, it carries the idea of someone coming alongside of. I beseech you, brethren. Now we must remember that this church had problems. As a matter of fact, in the first letter that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, there was a problem in every one of those chapters. First Corinthians chapter 1, they were divided over preachers. First Corinthians chapter 2, they had to be told in spiritual wisdom. First Corinthians chapter 3, they had become carnal minded. First Corinthians chapter 4, they turned out to be judgmental, hypocritical people. First Corinthians chapter 5, that's where a boy had his dad and his wife. First Corinthians chapter 6, saints was going to court on a Friday suing one another over trivial matters and coming back into the Lord's church on a Sunday particular the Lord's Supper. First Corinthians chapter 7, they had to be taught on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. First Corinthians chapter 8, they were eating meat off of the aisle. First Corinthians chapter 9, they didn't want to pay the preacher. What's my subject? Corinthians chapter 10, they begin to call the, word, the worst examples of Old Testament Israel. First Corinthians chapter 11, men was all over the hell. Women was all, women was all over the hell. Didn't nobody understand the Lord's Supper. First Corinthians chapter 12, there is nine spiritual gifts. First Corinthians chapter 14, arguments over the distribution of those gifts. And right between First Corinthians chapter 12 and First Corinthians chapter 14, that was Paul's great love chapter. And Paul says, I don't care what kind of gift you have, if you don't have love, you are nothing. First Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter. And when Paul got through, Paul says, now then, first Corinthians chapter 16, let me see how much you appreciate Jesus. It's time to pay. Now then, here come the collection. So that was a problem in all 16 of those chapters. No wonder said Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, I'm coming alongside of you. I'm begging you, brethren. Paul is appealing for unity among brethren. Well, how is this to be attained, Paul? By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As so many times we'll say, by the name of the name of means by the authority of. Let's call Jesus Christ on the witness stand and see what he said. In John 17, verses 20 and beginning, Neither pray after these alone, but with them also, which shall believe on me through their word, that they all might be two, three, four, five, one. As thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also might be one. That the world, not the church, but that the world might believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. High in them and thou me. That they may be made perfect in one. That the world may believe and might know that thou hast sent me. And has loved them as I have loved thee. John 17, 21, 23. Here in Jesus Christ's great prayer. 
He prayed for unity. But he prayed for a certain kind of unity. And that unity is produced as a consequence of all mankind submitting to divine revelation. Can you prove it, preacher? Yes, look at verse number 6. They have kept thy words. What about verse number 8? They have kept the words which I have given them. What about verse number 11? That they may be one as we are. What about verse number 14? They have kept thy words. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. What about verse 19? That they might also be sanctified through the truth. Now we can understand Jesus' prayer. In verses 1 through 5, he prayed for himself. Verses 6 through 19, he prayed for his apostles. Listen to verse 20 again. Neither pray I for things alone. Who are you praying for, Jesus? Are you praying for the world? Verse 9 tells us he's not. He's praying for his apostles. But now he's getting ready to pray for somebody else. Who are you going to pray for, Jesus? Them, them who? Is it just everybody? Let's develop that. Them that believe. Is it just believe only? Oh, I beg the different friend. The text continues to say, Them that believe on me. Is it just a no ass on that? I believe in Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh no, friend. Them that believe on me through their word. Friend, unity is based on the word of Almighty God. Them that believe on me through their word. And so here Jesus Christ, he prays this great prayer. That all that will come out of the acts of the apostles, if they believe on Jesus, John 7, 39, as the scripture has said, then we will all be one. That's the argument on the investigation. Unity among brethren. But I don't like that. Notice verse 10 again. By the authority of Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Here there is a pill among unity. Behold how good and how pleasant. It is for bringing the dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard. Even near his beard. It went down to the skirts of his garment. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing. Even life forevermore. Psalms 133. The appeal is upon unity among brethren. That you all speak the same thing. Did not Peter say something about that? If any man speak. Let him speak as the oracles of God. And that phrase, the oracles of God, just simply means by the authority of Christ in common with the Bible. Then a man minister, let him do it as the ability which God gave it. And in all things, God himself might be glorified. That we all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. God hates discord. Hates division. Never endorsed it. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. Occasions of stumblings. Contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. How to are them? Well, they will search say, not our Lord Jesus Christ. But their own bellies. And by good words and fair speeches. Deceive the hearts of the simple. Romans 16, 17 and 18. Did not Paul write in the Galatian letter, those that create sinful division are going to hell. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. But Paul continues to say, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly or completely joined or bound together. How, Paul? In the same land for the be of fire. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And in the same judgment. For it had been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them who are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Here the 
object of unity is predicated upon all men submitting to the teachings of Jesus. Paul echoed the same sentiments in Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore the fruit of the Lord beseech you that you are worthy of all cases of with your call. With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now listen to it. We've heard it over and over again. Let's hear it again. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're calling, one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father, one above all, and you all and through all. One body, there is one church. Neither listen to me. In the preceding verses, we are the one word of the vocation of Christianity. If we want to illustrate that, look at the United States Post Office. How many do we have? I don't see but one. But there are different congregations, or posts, if you will, all over the United States. Isn't it interesting? They drive the same color cars. Isn't it interesting that they dress appropriately? Isn't that interesting? We need to know where they are the vocation where we are called. And then the world can believe that there is one body. That body is the church. And also there is one spirit. Not only are we divided over one body, we're divided over one spirit. I realize and I recognize, for as a man that is led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. But brothers, sisters, friends, and neighbors, I'm still asking that question. How does the Spirit lead? I still believe there's only lead two possible ways. That's directly or indirectly. And if the Holy Spirit leads anybody directly today, the there's only one way he can know it. And that's based on his feelings. And feelings offer no proof or one's evidence of one relationship with God. While there are, you can just hit me over the highway and just keep on going. While there are thousands of people down there in that Brownville assembly think they're in a proper relationship with God based on their feelings. How many times have we all been misled by our feelings? How many times have we all been going down a road thinking we were going in the right direction only to learn 30 miles later we're going the wrong way? But our feelings say we were going in the right direction. But there is such a thing that's called a road map. There is such a thing that's called instructions of signs and numbers. How many times we all believe in and convinced we was doing something in the right way but yet upon checking the manual, upon checking the blueprint, Upon checking the instructions, upon checking the recipe, we suddenly discover we're doing it in the wrong way and we have to tear it all up and start all over again. No wonder the writer of Proverbs said, He that trusted in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 20, verse 26. There is a way which seems right unto a man. It looks right. He thinks it's right. It feels right. But the end thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 16, 25, Proverbs 14, 12. Let me tell you something, friend. If the Holy Spirit is leading anybody directly today, we don't have to preach the gospel. We can just sit back and let the Holy Spirit do that. We don't have to go out here and knock doors, set up Bible centers. We can just sit back and let the Holy Spirit do that. While that concept eliminates every human need and effort in the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we might as well say that Jesus Christ didn't know what he was talking about. When he said, human beings, I want you, not the Holy Spirit, I want you to go out all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What well, Jesus should have told the twelve, you just sit back on your bed of dominoes and chapels and just play that all day because I'm going to let the Holy Spirit take care of that for you. For as men as are led by the Spirit of God, but neither the Spirit leads us indirectly through and by means of the proclamation of this book. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. The soldier takes a physical sword. He inserts that blade into the physical heart of the enemy to separate the soul from the body to bring about physical death. The Holy Spirit.
spirit. Takes the spiritual sword, which is the word of God. And through the preaching and the teaching of this book, this word is inserted into the spiritual heart of the soul to separate sin from the soul to bring about spiritual life. Yes, I know the Holy Spirit leads our body. I know the Holy Spirit guides. I accept that too. I know the Holy Spirit draws me to God. But how does He do it, neighbor? He do it through the proper mission of this book. No other way, friend. No other way. And yet today, we're divided over the simple teachings of that given back. There is one spirit. We are all, that's the teachings, baptized into one body. But not only that, there is one body, there is one spirit, even if you are called in one or whoever you call them. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you be not slow for the followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely the blessings I will bless thee, and multiply thou will multiply thee. So after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. But men bear the swear by the greater, and no for confirmation is in him, the end of all strife. When God willing more money than to show the head of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, when he confirmed the Bible. Had by two immutable things in which it was impossible for the Lord to lie. We have a strong confirmation of fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Now listen to it. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entered that within the veil. Even Jesus forever made a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6, 11, and 20. Now you picture this. Here's a ship that's out in the sea. On the side of that ship, they have a whole huge anchor. That anchor is dropped down into that water, the depths of the sea, the bottom floor. And we cannot see that anchor, but we can see the chain. And our faith and our anchor, it depends on how strong the chain is that is attached to the ship and that is attached to the anchor. Neighbor, my hope is anchored in King Jesus. My hope is not to be here on a renovated earth. That's one hope too many. My hope is not in a mountain Zion hope. That's two too many. My hope is not a new hope. This hope I'm talking about is over 2,000 years old. And that's in King Jesus. And when my ship sit, begin to experience the, the waves and begin to rock, the anchor in King Jesus will keep me steadfast. And unmovable. There is one hope. And it's not Zion hope. It's not good hope. It's not a new hope. Not only that, there is one body, one spirit, one hope, one law that is the authority. There is only one law that's going to judge every man in this dispensation. And that's the law of Christ. Jesus Christ himself said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. For the words that I speak, the same are going to judge him in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Romans 2 and verse 16. One faith, one baptism, one God. Now look at the equation. It's interesting. One body, one spirit, one hope, one faith, one baptism, and the last is one God. Right within the center, there is one Lord. Because with the one Lord, without Him, the whole thing falls. But I tell you something else, neighbor. I don't know if inspiration had it uh, intentionally. But God is all the way at the last. Because in order to get to God, you've got to come through the one body. In order to get to God, you've got to come through the one spirit. In order to get to God, you've got to come through the one hope. In order to get to God, you've got to come through the one baptism. And that just might be intentionally. God's wonderful plan of unity. That's the context in which we find the question, Is Christ divided? Now let me go on down where the rubber meets the road. Because there are some things that is going on in the Church of Christ that we can't seem to agree on. I want to start right out on top. And that's worship. 
I still believe John 4 and verse 24. And that was the only passage I had that will be enough to suffice the point. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in proof. I still believe we have the aim. That's God. We have the action. That's worship. We have the absolute must. We have the attitude. Spirit, right attitude. And we have the authority. And that's true. And I still believe in Arizona, the five backs. And let's start off with preaching. Back to that context. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 23. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe neighbor. Now that's gospel. But just let us suppose it was not God's pleasure to save this lost and dying world. Then friend, that would be the gospel to preach. The word gospel means good news. Bible speaks of the gospel of your salvation, Ephesians 1 and 13. The great apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, well, the full that that gospel deals with the basic fact that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul also says that that gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believes Romans 1 and 16. Well, the very heart of the gospel will make a it please God to save. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching, not through the preaching of foolishness. There was a difference. But through the preaching, well, through the foolishness of preaching. But through what kind of preaching? Well, not just any preaching. Because Paul says some men teach things that they ought not. Titus 1.11 Jesus warned us about some folks that were going to try to deceive us. Matthew 24 and 4. Also spoke of false prophets. Matthew 7 and 15. What have been through what kind of preaching is it going to take to save this lost and dying world? Back to that first Corinthians 1. Verse 17. Maybe it's going to take the preaching of the gospel. Verse 18. It's going to take the preaching of the cross. Verse 23. It's going to take the preaching of Christ. Now these are three separate preachings. But maybe they're all one and the same. And when you add them all up. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 to 23. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching the gospel of the cross of Christ to save them that believe. Our pulpits need to be filled full with the gospel of the cross of Christ. And then not only that, we not only about preaching as one aspect of worship. But we're divided over singing. In spite of all of the passages, all of the mandated passages that tell us how we must sing. And yet and still, so many things has infiltrated the worship and congregations that has a certain sign hanging out there in the parking lot. We are beginning to hum. We are beginning to make mechanical sounds with our mouth. My question is, or the director's question, is Christ divided? That's what I want to know. Every congregation of God's people must worship God the same identical way. That would eliminate it. Speaking to yourselves in song. The word speak eliminates humming. Using words. The last time I looked up the word humming and did an in-depth study, I come up with this simple definition. It just simply means to make musical modulations without articulation. To articulate, you use words, syllables, and phrases. If the Lord didn't use the word speak, you might be able to get away with that. 
But that's the end of that theory. We have to speak using words. And so much has to be said about that. But not only that, this hand clapping situation has infiltrated the worship of our Lord. Let me just illustrate it to you like this. I still believe in the verb, uh, the, 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 uh, the Greek word, baby. We must, you can't get around it. We must worship God with the right attitude and according to some divine objective standard. And that's New Testament teaching. And it's, really amazing. It's, it's amazing to me how the word must modifies our worship. It's amazing to me how the word must modifies baptism. You remember those two questions that was asked about who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, what would you have me to do? Go down in the street and go down in the city, and it shall be told on you what you must do. Well, Saul went down there penitent, but after three days, the gospel preacher told him what he must do. Acts 22 and verse 16. And I'm taking the position they with anybody can come into the Lord's church. And clap their hands in worship, then I can spray up a baptism. Because the same word must modifies baptism as the same word must modifies worship. The same way it is with the eldership. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires the good work. A bishop did must be blameless. He must be the husband of one wife. When the congregation of churches of Christ, well, I shouldn't say that because we already have women elders, but here it is now. If you are going to clap your hands, then all of us should have women elders because the same word that modifies the husband of one wife is the same word most that modifies worship. The same word most that modifies faith in Hebrews 11 and 6. The same word most that modifies worship. Where are you going, Mike? Let me, let, me, let me get a little bit more of this in here. Because there is no need for us to lift this passage out of this contextual setting and start talking about them. Let's talk about us. This emotionalism. Friend, listen to me. When a man obeys the gospel, he becomes connected to the true God. He can produce being the fruits of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control in the world. When we teach people out of the charismatic movements that are used to uh, being on the track teams in that worship, doing a hundred yard dash around the church, have a gymnastic team jumping over pews, how are you going to stop that man? You take the word of God and you show him and you teach him the fruits of the Spirit. One of the fruits of the Spirit in neighbor is self-control. Don't tell me a man can't control himself in worship. Yeah. Don't tell me that. Not only that, we teach him to add to your faith virtue, virtuous temperance, the word there, self-control. Then not the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep my body, un I'm talking about an inspired man here, under control. What about 1 Corinthians 14, 32? Never that won't work. This emotionalism, the waving of the hands. It just will not fit New Testament teaching. And yet and still, the Church of Christ has become divided over simple, plain, A, B, C, 1, 2, 3. New Testament worship. It's just that elementary. There are so many I would like to mention, like marriage. I still believe Genesis 2. Matthew 19, 46. One man from one woman from the marriage altar to the cemetery until death separates the union. Not until sin separates it. That's God's law. With one exception. Unless you think, I don't know about that. <laughs> but friend, we need to teach the permanency of marriage. What well, therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. The test of that verb is present and dignity. Meaning, you are the cause of your attention to your marriage. Lukewarmness, neglect, 
infidelity. Whatever it is that calls your love to go cold, calls you to separate, don't you dare do it. You work at your marriage. You let it work. You give constant detail and attention to it. Whether it's the first day, second week, third month, or fifth year, yeah. keep working on your marriage. That's what that passage says with the word of Sunday in it. Friend, and I know I'm talking to faithful brethren here. And I know brethren write so much about this in the printed page. And I appreciate it so very, very much. But we need to continue to sound the alarm. Teach the Bible in its context when it comes in dealing with these matters. I know that there are preachers out there. And I know that they are fondling with the God of Christ. I know that they have seduced her and has impregnated her with all of this stuff. But when Jesus comes back, Corinthians 11 verse 2, the church must be presented to him as a chaste virgin, just like it was established on the day of Pentecost, if we want to see God's face in peace. Let's listen to Jesus' words. Jesus divided on his plan for the salvation of the saving of mankind's soul. It was Jesus himself said, No man can come unto me except the Father which is in the joy. I raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man that will heard then learn of the Father coming unto me. This is the first step of coming to Christ. That's why Jesus told his apostles, you go and make disciples of all of the nations and tell them how to do it. Listen to what Jesus says about belief. I tell you nay, except or unless there's the condemnation. You believe that I'm he, you are dying your sins. In verse 21 of Acts 8, uh, John 8, where I am, you cannot come. Listen to what Jesus says about repentance. I tell you nay, except Oh, yes. That's the condemnation. You repent. You should all likewise perish. Listen to what Jesus said about confession. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, and will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. And verse 33 of Matthew 10 says, Jesus, if you won't, I won't. Listen to what Jesus says about baptism. He that believeth and that is baptized shall be saved. How many times we've shown that conjunction and conjunction, conjunction, what is your function? It bridges a gap of what's about to be said, what has already been said. And neighbor, let's take God's plan of salvation. Let's take his worship and keep it right where God has it. And when all New Testament people that are faithful to God, when we come in such as settings like this, we may all the demons and hell fall one more time because of our clean, our pure worship to God. When we worship God according to this book, then God the Father is glorified. When we worship God according to this book, then God the Son is magnified. We worship God according to this book, then the Holy Spirit is gratified. We worship God according to this book, then the Bible is amplified. We worship God according, and I know the Bible has been ratified. We worship God according to the book because it has been certified. When we worship God according to truth, then the church is edified. When we worship God according to truth, then all faithful children of God can be satisfied. And when we worship God according to truth, maybe the devil is horrified. Let's stick. With the book. While we sing, won't you come?